everybody and welcome to Let's Go Live. It's episode 31 and it's Oceans Week. I'm Maddie. Hello everyone, I am Greg and all together now, we, we are, are live. live! Yeah, we are loud! We are, oh wow, sorry. <laughs> um, we can, you can join us here in our spare room weekday mornings at 11am. You sure can. Today we're going to be continuing our ocean adventure. Yes. Uh, we're first going to chat about why the oceans are important mm -hmm. and then we're going to head out to the top layers of the open ocean for a quiz. <laughs> yeah, with a special quiz master as well. Um, first of all, thank you if you're with us live right now. And if you're joining us later, hello. We hope you've had a wonderful day. Um, who's in the live chat? Let's have a look. Who is in the live chat today? We have got Margot and Frida in Streatham. Hello. <laughs> Callum in Aberdeen. Can't wait. We've got Arthur and Annabelle in Braintree. Hello. Uh, Dia in India. Hi. Hi. Uh, we've got Elliot watching with his dad, Tim. Hello, you two. <laughs> Alfred in Edward in Hull. We have Amelie in Winslow. Hello, uh, Brennan in Shropshire. Hi, We've got Brennan. Sammy from the Philippines. It's a worldwide show today. It really hello, is. Hello. International. Uh, Flora in York. Uh, Sebastian in Gately. How else do we have? So many. Penelope and so Marnie many. in Devon <laughs> from um, all over the place. Tell you who else we've got, Maddie. Ah, someone else watching live is a man who goes by the name of the Blowfish. Here he is. <laughs> yeah. Heavy metal marine biologist, the Dublin fish, going to be joining us later on in the show. Love that. Thanks, fish. <laughs> what an appearance. What an appearance. <laughs> He's still rocking out, by the way. Love He's still that. Going. He's still here. Um, First, though, um, let's take a look at what you lot got up to in yesterday's show. Mm -hmm. We made a coral diorama. We did. We also had two uh, little friendly sea otters. Yeah. nipped by to help us out with a, a sea urchin Yeah, the problem. population was getting out of control. It we was. should say that Fish is going to be talking to us later about uh, some of the lesser known animals you might find in mm. the open ocean. But really back to, to your makes and activities because they're fantastic. We saw hundreds of dioramas yesterday. We sure did. Okay, let's Should've have looked. a look. Yeah. Right, uh, the one. This is Nicholas and Thomas. They didn't have a shoebox, so they improvised and created their own coral diorama in the bathtub. <laughs> we thought this was so fun. That's Thank amazing. You. Really, really made us laugh. We just thought that was amazing. Uh, with, this is Jasmine and George who built their own kelp forest complete with sea urchins, rocks, shells and starfish using ferns and weeds for the kelp, paint, play-doh, spaghetti and polystyrene packaging. All the, all the stuff. Uh, this is Matilda. She made made a coral diorama and it also has a great message about protecting our oceans which is something we'll be talking about in tomorrow's show about ocean helpers. Uh, this is Max who loves the ocean and has a collection of ocean toys including a shark, a sea lion, a crab and an octopus. Ah, oh, great Max. Uh, Jackson and Austin they made a submarine for their digestive Dave. <gasps> we haven't seen our di digestive Dave hasn't made an appearance. He is back there just so you know. If that's you've just teddy. joined us for Oceans Week it's the yeah. first week for Let's Go Live we quite often like to dress our teddy up in the theme. Yeah. Yeah, he's got his goggles on and he's got his fishing net, but um, yeah, love that submarine you've made. Uh, they also made paper octopus as well. Uh, octopuses for him to spot uh, from inside a submarine. And then lastly, we've got Rosie. Oh, I love this. Rosie's made a kelp forest and used the wool to make her sea otter fluffy. Uh, oh. She's even got some sea urchins in there and a stingray at the bottom. I love that you made kelp dioramas as well. That wasn't something we suggested, so that is all your own creativity. And um, we get all of the photos that we use in the show from our email address so if you want to appear in the show then you need to get a grown-up to email us hello let's go live at gmail.com and that's where we find them all, all so right. let's, let's get started yeah let's do let's it let's start. do it so we want to look today at reasons why the oceans are important and there are three big reasons so if we think about the ocean what is it full of it is absolutely full of fish but why might that be important greg uh, sorry i've just put reason one don't mind me i'm just um just got a bit peckish what already it's a bit early in it greg we've already had breakfast i don't know what's for lunch what i it's been you're, half eating, an hour. you're eating a tuna fish sandwich at 11 o'clock in the morning oh, oh i see what you've done oh the studio is gonna smell great nice one <laughs> didn't think about that one did i <laughs> why are you eating a tuna fish sandwich greg because Tuna is a fish and yes. our oceans are home to lots and lots of fish. Mm -hmm. and in yes. fact, fish are the main source of protein for one and a half billion people on the planet. 
Wow. So that is the first reason why the oceans are so important. Okay, actually yesterday we talked about the shelf seas, the shallows, coral reefs, kelp forests, and we were saying how they are full of fish and an enormous variety of marine life. However, later when we head to the top layers of the open ocean, we'll actually find that there's very little marine life out there. So much so, we tend to refer to them as the, uh, the marine deserts. But Blowfish is going to tell us more about the marine life that has managed to make it home. Nice. So that was reason one. Mm -hmm. uh, the ocean provides lots of food that mm -hmm. uh, feeds lots of people over the planet. Uh, why the ocean is important. Reason number two. Now, <laughs> this is ambitious. For this, I am going to try to create a model of the ocean. All okay, right, then. Let's, let's see if this We're going to have to shift things around just a little bit. So I am going to be using the globe here. And... Greg is lifting onto our set a tank full of water. What could go wrong? I, uh, all the things could go wrong here. Um, and we've just lifted that tank up slightly on two bricks so that we can place some things underneath it. Greg, explain to us, how is this going to work? Okay, so this is gonna be our model of the ocean. And yes. I'm gonna start actually by making this part here the equator. Okay, so what is the equator? Well, it's the imaginary line that goes around the centre of our Earth, like this. And at the equator, it's hotter, and that's because it receives more direct sunlight. So if it's hotter at the equator, we need to make it hotter in our model of the ocean. How are we doing that, Greg? Right, so I've got some hot water here. Yeah. Uh, oh, look, you can see the steam. So yeah. I'm pouring this hot water into some plastic cups uh -huh. and I'm placing them at this end of the tank. So that is going to heat the water up. Nice. Just like the sun heats up. The water uh, at the equator. Especially the water around the equator. So we're now getting nice warm water around the equator. Oh, yeah, it's getting all steamy already, actually. Okay, so if that's the equator, what's happening on this side of our model? This side of the model is going to represent the polar ice cap. Okay, so the polar ice caps, if I look from refer to our globe again, they are uh, here at the top of the planet. This is the Arctic. So I can show you just mm -hmm. like that. So this is the Arctic. And then we've also got them down here at the bottom. And this is the Antarctic. So these are the polar ice caps. How are we doing this one then, Greg? <laughs> All right, so this one, I've got some ice. <laughs> got to keep it cold. I've been keeping it cold with other ice blocks. So nice. let's put the ice cubes. Oh, so Greg has actually also made these ice cubes oh, cold blue. So we can see what happens to the cold water in our model. Very so cold. You just have to look very carefully at what happens to the cold <laughs> Very cold. <laughs> to the cold water and the warm water. All right. So we have cold water over here by the polar ice caps and we have water warming up here at the equator. What are you doing now? I'm just gonna add some uh, red food coloring so we can kind of track where that water is going. Yes, all right, okay. And if this works, uh, if this some works. blue food coloring over here just to help a little bit as well. Okay. Uh, can we see it on the camera? Let me switch to uh, water cam. Wow. Oh, it's not bad, right, okay, hang this on. This looks I've got cool. Idea. Let's put some white paper up behind it. Does that right. help? Yeah, that does help. Oh okay. my goodness, this is working so well. Is it? I can't see. Right, you lot, what can you see happening? You can start to see this flow of the coloured water and see that the, the, the blue water, the cold water has sunk and the red water, the hot water has risen up and then started to move across the tank. Yeah, that's what the, the blue water is doing that as well. You can actually see how it has sunk and now it's moving over towards the equator side of the model. So that is because cold water is more dense, so it sinks down and yeah. hot water is less dense, uh -huh. so it rises up. And as that cold water sinks, yeah. it pulls water in above it and that, that hot water comes across. And as the hot water rises, it pulls water in below it and that's the cold water coming in below it. And we actually see it set up a current. It's like a circular right? it's like pattern. It's like a circular current in the water and we see that on the planet. We do. Can we see another close-up first of all? Because this yep, is so on. cool. Oh, wrong camera. That's me. This camera. That's better. Oh, that's the back of the pad. <laughs> How does that look? Oh, that's not bad, you know. We, oh, no, yes, hello. So you can see the red, the hot water has moved from the equator to the polar ice caps. The cold water is moving the polar ice caps around Amazing. the equator. Yes. So we do actually see this happening in our oceans. So if I refer back to our globe here, what happens, globe you've cam. got a model here, globe brilliant. Cam. So warm water flows away from the equator 
and then the cold water at the poles, it sinks and flows towards the equator where it gets warmed up and then it will rise and flow away. And we so get we exactly get this, the same. Yeah, so that happens in the, in the, in the northern hemisphere yeah. and it also happens in the southern hemisphere where you have warm water flowing away from the equator and then you have cold water at the poles flows towards the equator where it gets warmed up and then flows away. So you get this circle, this circular motion in the water. What it's do we call it? It's called the thermohaline circulation and it happens down in the deep layers of the water. Yeah. But there's some interesting stuff happening on the surface as well. Right? Yeah, we get currents on the surface too. And these are created uh, by the wind. <laughs> and also because our Earth is, is spinning, it's rotating. So that also creates surface currents. And then what happens is those surface currents interact with those deep currents. Mm -hmm. And yes, I've seen you in the live chat. You want a fact bomb, <laughs> you just wait for this, right? The surface and the deep currents all connect up together and they create something called the great conveyor belt, right? Let me show you a picture of this. Uh, an absolutely massive Love that. current. So you've got cold bits coming down from the polar, you've got the hot bits coming from the, up from the equator. They form these kind of circular bits we call gyres. It's mega interesting. But what's the fact bomb, Greg? The fact bomb is that if you travelled with one little droplet of water around the whole of the Great Conveyor Belt, it would take 1,000 years to complete that whole journey. Fact bomb. Yes! God, they don't really work for they rarely work first time. That was great. A thousand years for a single droplet of water and to make it round. That is why the ocean is important because it's moving that hot water and that cold water around the planet. It's regulating the temperature of the planet. So it's working a little bit like our planet air conditioning system, mm. right? Yeah. But what would happen if we didn't have currents like this? Well, actually, uh, due to global warming, mm -hmm. climate change, which, which we've talked about during Project Earth Week, mm -hmm. uh, the global conveyor belt is slowing down. And that means that that heat isn't spread around the planet, the heat and the cold, and that's gonna mm -hmm. have all sorts of problems. Uh, it's also thanks to uh, more rainfall and it's going to stop, uh, there's going to be a lot more melting of the polar ice mm -hmm. caps and that's going to slow down that conveyor belt, mm -hmm. which is going to lead to temperature changes, which can affect the marine wildlife and our wildlife and us on the, on the land. Okay, so thanks to our oceans, they are our planet's temperature regulators. It's our air conditioning unit. Okay, so whilst Greg clearing this away, the next time you dip your feet in the sea, why don't you have a think? The water that you are standing in has traveled thousands of miles around the globe, which is super, super cool. And um, if you do want to try this experiment at home, we've linked a little version uh, in the description box below that's a bit simpler and doesn't need uh, such a big tank, but it's fun for us to show you that um, so you can all see what's happening. Um, but these currents, they don't just regulate temperature, they also carry some animals around with them as mm, well. They do, animals and little, uh, little plants as well. Mm -hmm. uh, they're called plankton. Right. Now plankton are these tiny plants and animals that fly float along at the mercy of the sea's currents and the tides. And yeah. their name comes from the Greek word for drifter or wanderer. Because that's so what they're, they're doing. drifting around. <laughs> we do, we, is that our plankton impression? <laughs> that's our plankton impression. <laughs> drifting we'll, in the current. We'll keep that one for the quiz dance later. <laughs> All right then. Um, but some of these uh, are phytoplankton and they do something really, really important. And this actually gives us reason three why the ocean is so important. Uh, we've got a picture of some phytoplankton just here. Here it is. Here you go, this is one type of phytoplankton. Yeah. Uh, phyto means plant and phytoplankton are tiny drifting algae. But they do the same important thing, the, the thing that plants above water do. Um, and Greg's actually got a video that he made a while back in our old flat to show you. Okay, here we go we got here, Greg? All right, so here's me uh, from the past. That's our old little <laughs> flat, little patio. And I've got a bit of pondweed in here. Now, um, pondweed is doing the same thing as the trees and the plants do. Uh, the same thing as smaller phytoplankton do as well. So it's called photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to use that microscope camera on top. We're going to flip to that. And we're going to have a look at a bit of the top of the pondweed That's inside. Just in some water. It's just in some water, yeah. And let's have a look at what's going on at the uh, on the edge of the pondweed. Focus now, camera. wait, 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 that. Ooh, did you I, see? I saw a little bubble. It sort of like just just came off the stem there. So um, what all these plants are doing, this algae is doing as well, it's called photosynthesis. And it's happening in algae and trees and plants. It uses sunlight to make sugar. And it's also producing something that's very, very helpful for us. And it's what's inside those bubbles. Oh, there's another bubble. Ooh. 
Love that. Do you not know? <laughs> Any guesses what that is inside those bubbles? The gas inside the bubbles is... Oxygen. oxygen. Yes. yes. Now, we talked about oxygen in, I think it was show number eight in Brilliant Bodies. Well, that, was, that's a, that was a while ago. It was, it was a long <laughs> while ago, yeah. And how oxygen is one of the gases in the air around us, and it's the gas that we need to mm. breathe in to create the energy that we need to do absolutely anything. Yeah, without oxygen, we couldn't live. So, do you want to tell them another really cool fact? Okay, Get the yeah. fact bomb ready. Uh, I'm getting the fact bomb ready. Right, so... <laughs> You may have heard that forests, especially rainforests, produce the oxygen mm -hmm. that we need to breathe. Well, actually, over half of the world's oxygen is produced by phytoplankton in the ocean. What? We always think of that being the job of trees, forests, rainforests. You don't even think about these tiny, tiny little creatures that are in the sea. Plus, they're also super important. Mm -hmm. That's that's why they're reason number three, the ocean. Yeah. And it produces a lot of that oxygen. Mm -hmm. But the phytoplankton are also important for something else. And that's because they are at the bottom of the food chain. So you've got the phytoplankton. Those are those tiny, tiny drifting algae. But then we've also got these guys. And this, these are a zooplankton. And zooplankton are tiny animals that eat the sugary phytoplankton. Then the zooplankton are eaten by fish and those fish are eaten by bigger predators like us or some of the other marine animals that Blowfish is going to be talking to us about in just a moment. Um, now, some of those zooplankton just drift around, right, permanent in the ocean's currents. Uh, others are larvae. And that means ocean babies. Ocean babies. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we call these larvae plankton because they're not yet strong enough to swim. So like the other zooplankton, they're just floating around in the currents until they are able to swim themselves. This uh, we've got one great. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so here is one of these uh, zooplankton, one of these larvae. Look at it. Look at its little funny face. So that is actually... What do you think it is? Oh, yeah, what do you think it is? You might have seen this fish before. It looks mm. weird. Should we show them? Yeah, it's a baby Mola Mola. And this is a cool fish. It's actually one of my favourite fish. Uh, so that's what it looks like when it's all grown up. Here's uh, the plankton no longer, again. no longer zooplankton anymore. If you look at the look at the plankton form, you can actually see it's kind of you can kind of see the resemblance. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we said earlier that um that well we, earlier in the week we looked at shelf seas the shallows and we found that in coral reefs and kelp forests there was an abundance of life however when you go out into those top layers of the open ocean it's a bit like a marine desert there just isn't much there so the animals that do decide to make it home they have adapted so they can survive uh, and the mola mola is a really great example of this but to tell us more about it and to be today's quiz master is a really good friend of ours it is heavy metal marine biologist, the blowfish. <laughs> hello, 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 hello. How are we doing, guys? Yeah, that's good. We're just doing a little rejig re so you can see us both. Oh, there jig we go. Jig away, jig thank away. Thank you so much for joining us, buddy. No, no, thank you for having me. Is that a fish tank behind you? Behind you? It is. We have a nice uh, reef fish tank and in there, something not so wet. This is Ghibli, the crested gecko. Oh, oh, cool. So today we're talking about the open ocean and we mentioned that it can be known as a marine desert. Why is that? Well, there's a lot of complicated reasons, but the bottom line is that uh, there's so much plankton trying to grow there that they use up all the fertilizer. So actually, rather than there being loads and loads of plankton, there's no food for them and there's not that much in the way of plankton. Ah. So when we look at the ocean and we see it's big and blue, we just assume there's lots of life there, but that's not the case. That's absolutely true. The only place where you get loads of life in clear blue water are around coral reefs really productive and this means areas full of life really productive seas are the green ones like our own coastline cool so you're going to talk to us about some of the lesser known bigger uh, marine animals that you'll find out in the open ocean we've already mentioned the mola mola so can you just tell us a bit more about it Certainly shout. The Mola Mola is an absolute beast. Big fan, big fan. Now, uh, this is the heaviest bony fish on the planet, okay? But weirdly enough, although we see him at the surface, that's not where he does his business. He dives down deep into the cold, dark waters and munches on jellyfish. The thing is, it's really cold down there, so he has to come back to the surface and warm himself up. 
And with that, I have my first question for you. Oh, okay. Ooh, okay. Ooh, before you give us the first quiz question, um, and everyone's saying this in the live chat, we can't go into the quiz without the quiz music. And we didn't tell you this, Blowfish, the awkward quiz dance. Let's see you dance. Come on. We're going to be plankton. Oh. Drift. Drifting plankton. Or being a sunfish. He's doing the beard dance. We haven't had that before. Just gave away the first question. Okay. <laughs> All right, there we go. All right, so, Blowfish, what is... <laughs> Your first question on the quiz. First question about the molar molar. What is his common name? Okay. Is it A, the moonfish, or B, the sunfish? Okay, so this is a question for you lot watching. Yes. Is the molar molar the sunfish or the moonfish? Hmm, if you were any keen ears may have heard me just say Someone it. Someone <laughs> just said it during the quiz dance. What is it? What's the answer, Blowfish? It is the sunfish. <laughs> It's the sunfish. <laughs> Why? Well, like I say, they come back up from the deep, dark, cold waters to warm themselves in the sun. And so sailors used to see them basking, getting a nice little suntan, and they just used to call them sunfish. Oh, cool. Sweet. All right, on to uh, your favourite, lesser known, lesser loved, open ocean <laughs> the critter. The next one. The next one. Well, I'm going to go for the lion's mane jellyfish. Oh, Aww. yes. Yeah. Now, we all know about jellyfish. Well, this guy is the biggest jellyfish on the planet, okay? So I have question number two for you. Okay. Oh, all right. right. So he's the biggest jellyfish on the planet, right? But is he, A, 18 metres long, which is the size of a double-decker bus? Right. Or is he, B... 36 metres long, i.e. two double-decker buses. What do you reckon? And what do you think? I mean, come on. Just being the size of a double-decker bus is huge. I'm trying to think it of a can't... jellyfish and then unscaling that up. It can't be two. What do you think? What do you think in the live chat? What does everyone think? Put it in the live chat. A or B? If you're watching back, yell it out. What's the answer, Mr Blowfish? The answer is... B, the length of two double-decker buses. Wow. I a lion's mane jellyfish is actually longer or can certainly grow to be longer than a blue whale. What? I can't believe that. Gosh, That's that true. is so cool. You get yourself a fact bomb for that, mate. That's Oof. amazing. Okay. Boom. Next one. What's next? Right. Next one. We have the uh, remora. Mmm, yes. Now this this guy this guy's a little bit weird. He's a little bit woo, a little bit way, you know, he's a bit of a geezer. <laughs> because he doesn't actually rely on the open ocean to give him his food, but he relies on animals in the open ocean to give him his food. Because the back of his head is super sticky. Like kind of like mine. So you can <laughs> stick. I've got a close up picture of the uh, of the sucker. Do it, actually. do it, go. do it. Whoa. Yes. Funky. So he uses that special suction pad to stick to things like big sharks or whales or sea turtles. And then he rides around with them. And when they get some food, he gets some food as well. Oh, so that's quite clever. So that's his way of adapting to life in the open ocean. Yeah, Because he's if there's not much out there, you've got to try to find the food, right? Yeah. So if you can rely on someone else going and finding the food, you can just hitch a ride. Thanks. Yeah, it, it's worth mentioning at this point, though, that Remora quite often eat the poo of the animal that they live on. So just thought I'd, I'd throw that one in there. You know. Gotcha. All right, All right. Then. All right. What's the quiz question, then? <laughs> well, OK, so Remora, sticky heads, all that kind of stuff. What did native fishermen used to use Remora for? I'm going to... Well, they've got, a they've got a sticky head, so you could use them to stick to stuff. <laughs> so they use a DIY, a bit of ready. DIY. The, okay, I've got, an idea. I've got an idea. <laughs> I've, got, I've got an idea. Is um, if they had a hole in their boat, could they put the remora on it and it would plug the hole? <laughs> Obviously, not for long. Keep it watered. In. <laughs> that might actually work. No, I'll tell you. For uh, I'll tell you what they used to do. A, uh, um, African native fishermen used to take remora. They used to catch them, and then they tie a rope around the tail of the remora. And they'd wait until they saw a bigger fish in the water or maybe a sea turtle. And then they would throw the remora into the ocean. It would swim straight up to whatever that animal was, stick to it. And then the fisherman <laughs> could reel in the remora hook and the animal it attached to. Just like that. Just like a man wow. catching a grape. That is so fun. That's what? amazing. I think oh, we've yeah. got time for one more. Yeah, Can one you do more. one more for us? Okay, yeah. Right. I'm going to go for the Humboldt squid. Ooh. This is oh. an absolute 
huge squid, okay? And he works on the reverse of the molar molar. So he lives in the deep ocean during the day and comes up into the, the higher waters during the night to feed. So my question is this, what kind of mouth does a squid have? Oh, I know. What this do one. we reckon? What do we I reckon? Oh, one. yeah, I, I th yeah, I do know if, this one. If, if any clues, you might expect to find it on a bird. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, a that's, that's a good clue. <laughs> it's kind of giving it away. All right, Blowfish, what's does, the answer? Little... Well, it has a mouth just like this. Whoa! This is that this one? is the beak of a Humboldt squid oh. that I removed. You can see that there. Yeah, that's this amazing. This is the beak of a Humboldt squid, and you can see it's a proper nasty piece of kit. <gasps> this beak is so strong that these animals can pierce Kevlar, and we use that for bulletproof vests. Wow! <laughs> wow! Wow, we... Blowfish, that was an amazing quiz. Thank, Thank you so you. much. And no before worries. you go, we mentioned that a remora can stick to a whale. Um, or a whale a shark. Sorry, a whale shark. That's but, true. Uh, we've, we've definitely got some more shark fans watching right now. What type of sharks could we possibly find out in the open ocean? Well, you'll get things like blue sharks and oceanic white tips, which are open ocean wanderers. But you will also get some big predators moving through as well, such as the great white. And here is a tooth of a great white shark. Whoa. Look at that there. That's a big one. That's a big one. Look at you that there. Wow. You couldn't have given us a better link to a little sharky make that we're going to do right now. Ah, Ugh, very nice. planning. Uh, nice one, Mr. Blowfish. We're going to say goodbye. Thank you so much, buddy. Thanks, Fish. Thanks, guys. Thank that you was bye, awesome. Bye. bye. What oh, a legend. I can't believe that beak. I can't believe the beak. I cannot believe that. So is many amazing very, facts. That very was. cool. Okay, so we are. We do have a uh, a make for you. Um. <sighs> I'm just going to get this stuff out and show Let's you how to make out. it. Let's just do All it. Right. So um, we're going to talk about sharks. We're mm. going to make a little sharky make that you can try at home. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw this shark's tooth. Mm -hmm. We're going to make a whole array of shark's teeth. Um, mm. Have you ever... <laughs> Seen shark's teeth? <laughs> well, no. Like, not, not, not inside a shark's mouth. No, but you have Thankfully. seen a, you have seen the skeleton yes. of a shark's teeth. Yeah. Actually, we saw this at the Natural History Museum. This is a shark's jaw. You just can see how enormous it is. And we are going to show you how to recreate your own shark jaw out of paper plates. Nice. All right, so you're going to get <laughs> carefully cutting of the paper plate. If you don't have paper plates, uh, you could use just bits of cardboard mm -hmm. or paper. Maybe you use a box. Yep. Uh, you could use a leftover plastic bottle. You know, recycle creative. afterwards. See what you want to do. Oh, it's very simple, though. Let me just quickly show you how to start things off. You get your paper plates, turn it upside down so it's raised like this, and then you fold it towards you, and that's sort of what makes your mouth shape like that. And then the first thing I'm going to do is cut the shape of an M, and that will give us uh, the jaw outline. So, so different sharks have different size and different shaped teeth. Um, so great white sharks, as we saw, are quite triangular teeth. They're also it was serrated, yeah. So mm -hmm. like uh, like a bread knife. But a sand tiger shark, for example, um, they don't have the serrations around the teeth, but they are they're long and they're thin, and they are of course very pointed and very sharp mm. and then we talked about the whale shark earlier now that's a filter feeder which means it basically just opens its mouth and just sees what goes in <laughs> lots, of, <Great. laughs> lots of plankton um mm -hmm. but they do actually still have teeth yeah lots and lots of little ones they just don't use them so, all, I, so all i've done is so i cut that m shape in the paper plate and now we sort of, our jaw is beginning to sort of like look a little bit more like a shark's jaw. But the last thing we're going to do is cut a semicircle out of the folded paper plate and then we can just freely chop up our teeth. Um, very important that if you are using scissors and you want to make sure you have got the help of a grown up. Well like played, so. well played. Um, how many teeth do you have? Uh, adults, question, question for you lot. Mm -hmm. I thought you were mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Adults have 32 teeth. Yep. Um, a child with baby teeth has 20? Yeah, yeah, 20 teeth. 20? Yeah. Yes. And so <laughs> guess how many teeth a shark can have? Oh, I bet a lot. I bet a lot. How many? So um, they can have around, I mean, how? what was it? I'm trying to remember. It's about three whale sharks, those ones yeah. that have lots of the little ones, but they don't use them. 3,000 little teeth in a whale shark, Whoa. right? Um, sand tiger sharks, yeah. 100. Okay. Uh, great white sharks. Yeah. 300. 300 teeth yeah. in a great white shark. Yeah. 
Well, hang on. Gosh, you cut of... that quick. Well done. There you go. And oh. so all I've done is make our little teethy marks. Oh, we've even got little teeth. They've all fallen out. There we go. And there is your, is your shark jaw. But actually what we did is we layered our paper plates up because here's the thing. Sharks actually have rows of teeth and they can have as up to as up to as many as 15 rows mm. so you can see here we have just folded that front row from the paper plate up so that you can see there are two rows there let's have a look at that picture of you actually yeah with that, that jaw you can see the rows of the teeth yeah and they there. work a little bit like conveyor belts which is really useful because it means once that front row has been uh, used up or they've fallen out uh, great whites they tend to use their front two rows for example for grabbing onto their prey it means that the next row can move forward yeah. and then they fall out the next row moves forward so you've always got a nice new set of gnashers ready and waiting very cool we should do the selfie we should uh, and i'm wondering if blowfish is still there and whether we could come back for the selfie yeah he looks do like do you want to get there. your shark's tooth up blow there he is yeah. okay it's bring oh well done mate okay there he is so let's turn it so you're in the shot as well Mads. blowfish um, get your shark's tooth get your shark's tooth out mate because we've actually upgraded our paper plates and we've turned them into masks <laughs> Okay, oh, okay, so everyone, everyone get ready. Put someone in front of the screen or take a selfie. Mads, come a bit closer. Here we go. There you go. Three, two, one. It's, it's the awkward, awkward selfie. <laughs> well played. Thank you, Blowfish. Thanks. It's all right. What a champion. <laughs> awesome. Um, all I've done with these paper plates is I've just coloured the top blue and I've added some googly eyes. So if you want to, you could turn your paper plate shark jaw into a mask. And there we go. Nice. That is it. Right, it's pretty much time for us to say goodbye. Yeah, but before we go, let's see a couple more of your amazing uh, coral reefy dioramas that you made yesterday. They're all sent to this email address. Hello, let's go live at gmail.com. <laughs> all right then first up uh, this is Maya uh, Maya she used an old box for her diorama and she painted all the fish and corals and she even finished her decorations with some real shells lovely this is Ted Ted went to the actual rock pools near his house <laughs> to see if sea urchins were taking them over and there they are look all of his little homemade sea urchins are taken over <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Awesome. Evie, uh, she went on an urchin hunt around her garden with her otter pouches under her arms. Lovely. They are beautiful, Evie. Look how colourful they are. Yeah, painted the uh, the spines as well. Yeah. This is Melody. Um, Melody made this coral diorama and made loads of different materials, made, used loads of different materials. And she played a game where she had to find specific items in her reef using the sense of touch. Wow, a sensory box as well. Nice. Um, Elspeth, Samuel and Rose, they made a diorama using shiny wrapping paper and they even posed in their wetsuits for oh, a photo. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Love that. And last up, here's Arietti, Leary and Reuben who made this Lego coral reef complete with a little Maddie and Greg plus a turtle, a clownfish, treasure, submarine and of course a mermaid. Once again, Lego never fails. Never fails, does it? So today we've been talking about why the ocean is important, but we'd like your help for tomorrow's oh, show because yeah. we're going to be talking about how to be an ocean helper. So we think what would be a nice project for you this afternoon, why don't you um, come up or design your own poster which uh, tells us how we can all be ocean helpers mm. and also celebrate some of the reasons why you love the ocean. So an ocean helper poster. Send it to this email address with mm -hmm. the subject heading ocean helper to yeah. help us find them we get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds so that will really help thanks so much and um, heads up on friday we are going to be jumping in a submersible and diving deep into the ocean <laughs> and meeting the strange life that lives there yeah. so do send your posters in because we'd love to get them into tomorrow's show as always links are in the description box of the video uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already uh, and then you won't miss any of our videos in the future uh, a few quick uh, chats in the live chat. We've got Liam and Isabel in Buckinghamshire. We have Matthew and Thomas in Leeds. Uh, we have Esme in Bowden. May and Sarah in Leicestershire. We have Amber in Nottingham, Joe and Edward in Warminster, and Matthew and Thomas in Horsforth. Hey, <laughs> nice little speed up there at the end. Um, <laughs> as always, please share with anybody who you think might enjoy Ocean's Week. And H hello to everyone oh. who's watching back as oh, well. We yeah. always have to say hello. Thank you, everyone who watches at a later time. <laughs> um, yeah, please share with everyone. You've already said that. Go on, say the big words. Stay curious. Nice one. We will see you tomorrow. Thank you to the Blowfish. We will Bye. see you tomorrow at 11 o'clock. <laughs> Bye.